Especially, you're our honored guests, and uh, to all the regular members, welcome. To those of you who are joining us online, uh, you're also welcome, and thank you for doing so. And um, we miss a few of our men right now. They're up at the uh, camping retreat. I was able to be there on Friday night. I came back last night. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, definitely a lot cooler than it was down here, so that was really <laughs> nice. Um, just got to go out and spend some time together with the other men, uh, talk, and enjoy some spiritual discussions, some regular discussions, and go out and hike and enjoy the creation. Uh, highly recommend it. Uh, any of our camping retreats that we have, it's a great time to get to know each other just outside of these uh, four walls. But uh, if you are visiting with us, if you would please uh, grab one of the visitor cards in front of you, should be one, and um, leave that with one of the members. We'd just like to have a record of your visit. I hope that you will open up your hearts and your voices in song this morning as we sing, as we pray, and as we take the Lord's Supper and hear a portion of the word. It would please be standing for the next uh, songs before our, this song before our opening prayer. <clears throat> I'm not a warrior, I'm too afraid to live. I feel it qualified for what you're calling me to do. But Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse. Because broken people are exactly who you use. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a hope. Lord, be my defense, so I can face my giants with confidence. You took a shepherd boy and made him a king, so I'm going to trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror, because 
see you fight for me. I'll be a champion claiming your victory. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. Going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see them fall. Going to stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'll face my giants with confidence. Let's pray. Your God, our Father, our Creator, the one who loves us so much that you sent your Son to die for us. And now we know that we have confidence that heaven is our true home. And we'll be there with you someday. We thank you for your blessings, your love, your grace and mercy. Continue to be with us and help us as we strive to learn more about you. Thank you for being with Kenny and Dewey as he has sought you out and shares the word with us and teaches us and helps us. Dear God, there are those in our congregation who are struggling physically, have ailments and things that are not allowing them to come here. Please help them and help us to support them, to encourage them, to work with them in any way that we can. We as a family, need to be with one another, share each other's joys, each other's fears, each other's troubles and trials. And may you continue to help us do that. We thank you for the leadership here. Thank you for strengthening our members and helping us grow. <clears throat> and dear God, we thank you once again for your son who died for us. Be with us today as we learn more about you. And in your son's name, we offer this prayer. Yeah. Thank you, Warren. If you would please remain standing for the next uh, medley here, beginning with I Know That My Redeemer Lives. <clears throat> oh, so I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know.
Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. While God is marching on, I know. Song before the Lord's Supper this morning will be low in the grave he lay. Domi so low in the grave he lay. Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose, with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose, a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose.
If you would, uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Zechariah, the Minor Prophets here. We'll read from there in just a moment. In, in the context here, in uh, chapter 12 and 13, I'm going to read from there in just a moment. Um, in the context, there's a lot of prophecies here. Um, there's a lot going on behind all of this, but... Uh, for our purposes this morning, there's a lot of prophecy here about the restoration of Judah um, after they've been destroyed and uh, brought into exile and now they're back and Zechariah is trying to teach them about the things that they should be doing now that they're back in, uh, in Jerusalem. And so here in the middle of all that, in uh, chapter 12, I'll start, um, there are some really beautiful prophecies about Jesus uh, that I wanted to to bring to our attention this morning as we start to reflect on him um, and what he's done. So I'll read uh, chapter 12, verses uh, 10 through uh, 12 here, and then I'll jump to another spot. It says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the, house, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for Hadad Rimmon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn, each family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves. And then chapter 13, and verse 7 through 9. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire, and I will refine them as one refines silver, and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. So this clearly is about our Savior, Jesus, that came to this earth. And he was pierced, and he was mourned. Um, but then here on uh, the second part, where the, sh the shepherd is struck down, this is who we are. This is, uh, we are the people who say, the Lord is my God in this verse. We mourn him in his death in this memorial this morning, but we rejoice for the grace and the pleas for mercy that he talks about here um, that was brought to us through the death of Jesus. So if you would pray with me as we begin. <laughs> our great God and our Father, we come before you this morning so humbled to be in your presence, so humbled to be your children, a family that you have adopted, you have chosen us, uh, even while we hated you and we left you. Lord, you, through your Son, have accepted us and we Thank you for this bread that we're about to eat. We thank you for the body that was broken and sacrificed for us. It's through your son's name. Amen. Amen. Right. Things are growing. Pray again for the for the cup. Again, our Lord, we approach your throne, thanking you for this fruit of the vine that we're about to drink. Lord, you have taught us that the life is in the blood. 
And this, this juice that we drink is representative of the blood of Christ that uh, replaced the life that we should give. Lord, you demand, you demand justice for our sins, and you uh, have given your Son to, to give us that justice and to give us a hope of eternity with you through him. Lord, please bless this cup as we reflect on that, that blood that was shed for us. It's in his name. Was the Lord's Supper. Um, I'm going to take this time as well just to uh, present the offering. And uh, this is a, an opportunity that the members here have to um, take care of our own, to use these funds that we collect for the kingdom. That's the, the real reason that we do this, is that so the kingdom of God can be, can be spread. And we use that in a lot of ways to to assist our evangelists, to take care of our, our own places here, and to take those and take care of those that uh, need our assistance in the mountains. So if you would, let's let's pray together for that. Our God and our Father, you are so good to us. You bless us so far beyond measure, especially in this country. Lord, you provide for our every need and our every want. We just thank you so much for, uh, for that blessing that you give and for all those ways that you take care of us. Lord, help us to reflect and to be appreciative of those blessings and also to look for ways and opportunities uh, to give those blessings to others and shine your light to them. Lord, please help us as we give, to give cheerfully, to give in a way that will glorify you. It's in your son's name. <clears throat> Thank you, Jared. If you would uh, stand before it, uh, the sermon this morning and sing Shine, Jesus, Sun. Shine, Jesus, Shine. <laughs> oh, so, Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the fire. Set our hearts on 
seated. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to have you here. Good to be here. Glad you're here. I'm glad I'm here. I hope we're all glad we're here to praise our God, honor Him, and worship Him for all that He has done for us. Before I get into the lesson, I just uh, a little bit of housekeeping here so that everyone understands. Uh, uh, Dewey's been gone a couple of weeks to help take care of my mother, uh, which she's needed some help. And uh, Lord willing, I'll leave here Tuesday. I've got a meeting next week in Tennessee, and then after the meeting, we're going to take a week and go down and see some of our family that we haven't seen for a, a quite a while, for a, a long while, a uh, long stretch here for us. And so we'll be gone the next couple of weeks, and Lord willing, we'll be back by the end of the month. And so we're looking forward to that. In case anybody wants to know where we're at, uh, uh, that's going to be somewhere in the South, <laughs> eating barbecue, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, a couple of weeks ago on Wednesday night, we had uh, our singing, and at the end of the singing, uh, Ryan made an excellent point about uh, something that he had read uh, about an archaeological find that helped uh, establish, or I should say, it just supported the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And see, and he said at first, he thought, oh, this is great, you know. Archaeology has, has done something for my faith. And then he said, no, wait a minute. Uh, do I really need that? Does my faith need that? My faith was strong before I ever knew that. And uh, I uh, told him that, that that's an excellent point for everyone to understand. And the more I thought about it, I thought I'm going to incorporate that somehow into a, a lesson here in the next week or so. And tonight, tonight, this morning, uh, I'm going to try to try to do that. And we're going to talk about science. Uh, at the beginning of our lesson here. Uh, science is a word that uh, is, is a rather ambiguous, large word that just left our program. It's, it doesn't exist. There it is. There it is. We lost science there for a moment. Uh, that uh, unfortunately people feel like they're in said, Oh, if we could just find science to support the Bible. Let me ask you a question. Which came first, the Bible or science? The word science uh, is a combination of both French and Latin, but that just means knowledge and it was first used uh, back in uh, 1610 when Galileo was excommunicated from the church because of his knowledge that uh, the earth was not the center of the universe. And so the church decided that was blasphemy, so they excommunicated him. And later, of course, found out that he was right. The sun was the center of the universe. Uh, and then later in the uh, 17th and 18th century, uh, science was used to describe all kinds of disciplines. There was the uh, uh, physical science, which would be the mathematics and physics. There was the social science. Uh, there was uh, including theology, humanities, and the arts. It was a very broad term. It was in the 20th century where it was defined down a little narrower here to uh, the natural science, social science, and then the formal science. Uh, and people began to put more stock in science than in the word of God. And when they thought there was a discrimination or a uh, conflict, well, science, of course, is, is more noble and it's greater than the word of God. And that's where it really the growing disrespect for the Lord's word uh, was coming from and has resulted in where we are today. Now, I don't appeal to science. I, I, I don't care, it doesn't matter. But in this lesson, I'm going to show you something from science to show you how we can scientifically prove the light that we just sang about right now. I want you to turn to 1 John. While you're turning there, I'm going to just present something that maybe many of you are already aware of. That if you go online and look up scientific method, don't do that right now while we're speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I realized later that's what people were doing. Do that later, but you'll find when you put in scientific method, there are sometimes five, six, seven, even eight steps, depending upon who you're reading here, but they all basically cover 
these four steps. The scientific method that is used by all, quote, scientists, and that's a rather broad term as well, is to observe something that has happened, to observe a phenomenon, and then to test that observance, and then to retest it, and retest it, and after several tests of it, to formulate a conclusion or a hypothesis about what you have observed, and then to publish the results. And that is the way every scientist works. Whatever the issue or phenomena or discipline of thought may be, it always involves this process. Now, in 1 John chapter 1, I want you to read with me what John says in the very first verse of the first chapter of 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands. There's the first three steps of the scientific method. That life was manifest, there is the conclusion or hypothesis which was with the Father and was made manifest to us that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. That's step number four. John is saying we've used this. He didn't say this, didn't know this. These words weren't even in the language of whatever nation people were from. But the process as it developed, there was a logical sense of this is how we can go from something that we're not sure about to something now that I think we can fairly uh, pin down. This is something that happens and rehappens and rehappens with certainty and with, uh, with the, the truth of what we are seeing. Test it and retest it. Now, notice John just said that. We'll keep reading so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now he has just gone through the full process here in the first four verses. Now he's gonna repeat it in verse five. This is the message which we have heard from him and proclaim to you that, here's the conclusion of God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. The source of light. We talked about light a couple of weeks ago and the power of light, that light can overpower darkness, but darkness cannot overpower light. Light being the metaphor for that which is truth. Truth and light are synonymous. Darkness being the metaphor that is synonymous with error or lies or that which is not true. And the source of all liars, Jesus said in John 8, is the devil. From the beginning, he was a liar. That's right, Genesis 3. And so light is not found in the devil. There is no light to be found there. He may produce his own light, but it was like the black light or the red light or the yellow light that we might see a little bit there, but we can't see clear enough or plain enough, and no one would ever try to read or study under the light like that. Here is the light that he has brought to us. Now, here's where we want to look at this light a little bit further. That as John begins to explain the consequence of this life for you and for me for right now, it is resulting in the fellowship that we have with God. We recognize light, but we want to be in it. If we're out here in darkness and we see the light, uh, we are drawn to the light. Is anyone drawn to darkness? We're not drawn to darkness unless it comes night and we're ready to sleep. We, we need rest. But we look forward to the light. And if we've got chickens anywhere in the neighborhood, they'll let us know that the light is coming. <laughs> and we're drawn to it, but no one is drawn to this darkness. Now, John is going to tell us the consequence of this light. He said in verse 7, uh, verse 6, pardon me. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We, if we say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I have fellowship with God, but we're walking in darkness, we're just lying to ourselves. We're walking in the darkness. He said, verse 9, uh, verse yeah, 8 here, but if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
But then we're going to go over to chapter 3 and find out that those who practice sin uh, are not in God. Well, wait, wait a minute here. Let's begin in the first verse of chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Well, of course, we do not want to sin. That separates us from God. But if anyone sins, uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, we read this and think, hmm, okay. Uh, well, we're not supposed to sin. But if I sin, well, John says it's okay. We have an advocate with the Father, and he'll overlook this. Now, is that what he is saying here? Now, we've mentioned this once many months ago here, but now with this lesson, we want to focus a little more attention on it. And that's why this morning I'm reading from the English Standard Version because it does a more correct translation than the old King James or the new King James versions or some of the other versions you may have. Uh, this is going to show us really what is being said in, in this uh, discussion. He says at the beginning, I'm writing that you don't sin. But if you sin, it's okay if you have an advocate with the Father. Now, coming down here to the third chapter, this is where we're going to understand what John is actually saying about sin. In verse 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, what we understand is that in the first two chapters, when John said, if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father. That is a punctiliar one-time action. I've sinned. Oh, but he says, it's not the end of the world. You haven't lost it. This is not a one strike and you're out religion. God has shown us, as he's shown his disciples about forgiveness, if a person sins against you and then asks for forgiveness, should I forgive them? Yes. How about seven times? And he said, 70 times seven. As long as they're asking for forgiveness, and we, God will forgive us our sin. But now here in the third chapter, he's giving us a different picture. Someone who practices sin. Sin after sin after sin after sin. I mean, this is just part of my life. That's a complete different picture than in the first chapter. Someone who goes along and sins, they know it, they're sorry for it, they recognize it, we're broken hearted, as every person should be when they've sinned, should be broken hearted. God, I, I know I have let you down, please forgive me. John says, we have an advocate. Someone who will step in for us and say, judge, it's okay. We're on trial, we need an advocate. We need a lawyer. We need a mediator. We need someone who can make an appeal to the judge. The judge will listen to and say, not guilty. That's what we have. But the person who continues to sin and continues to sin, think of an individual who's brought before a judge who they committed a crime. And then they say, how do you plead? He said, I'll plead guilty because if I get out, I'm going to do it again and again and again and again. What do you suppose the judge would say? Who would ever want to be a lawyer for this person? There's not a chance while you're practicing this. But we have many cases of individuals who sin, maybe have had a lifetime of sin, then they stop it and in whatever process of correction, etc. Now every judge is going to be, I hope, sensitive enough to say, all right, we're going to give you another chance. I I I I've I'm not a fan of modern movies. Uh, I, this is not a this is not a judgment on any if you like to find that not, but I like John Wayne in the old westerns, you know, the good and back. I like the white hat and the black hat. You know, and I like at the end of the show, you know, the black hat goes to jail. Uh, or something. I, I I like those. But uh, there's a movie that uh, came out many years ago that uh, had a quote from it that just I, I can't get it out of my mind because it is so true in my life and I'm sure in everyone else's life. Uh, it was a sports movie and an individual, uh, his life didn't work out the way that he thought it should have. And he's looking back in retrospect. And the heroine of the movie, the, the girl who has known him since childhood, now as adults, she says this to him. She said, I believe that people lead two lives. The first is the life that we learn with. And the second is the life that we live with after that. 
She was making commentary on the mistakes that he had made as a young boy, and now he was paying for it. And now that, that is so universally true in all of us. We live a life that if for those who are in their sixth, seventh, or maybe eighth decade of life, we look back on our first two decades and we think, all right, if I had it to do over again, everyone says, everyone thinks, well, I would do things differently. I know I know I would. But the fact is, is that we have a life that's been given to us and we go through so many decades or so many years and we learn some of life's lessons. Some of them are tough. But then we get to that point after we've learned this. Now, here's the life I'm going to live with after I've lived that first life. So I don't know which life you're in right now. Hopefully we're all well into our second life. We'll still learn things, but hopefully the consequence won't be so severe. But in this life, in 1 John, John's telling us, yes, we sin. But then when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, verse 7. And we have forgiveness. But in here in chapter 3, here's the person who is just over and over and over and over. He's practicing sin. Now look at what John says about this individual. That sin is lawlessness. Now, verse 6, no one who abides in him, that is in Christ, keeps on sinning. First chapter, if we're in Christ, we sin, it's okay. We have an advocate with the Father. If we confess our sin, he'll forgive us our sin. But here now, this individual who just keep on sinning, and he cannot abide in Christ. No one who keeps on sinning either has seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. The righteous person isn't someone who did one good deed three years ago. I'm a righteous person. John says this individual is practicing righteousness. It's a day in and a day out endeavor. It is who I become. And every athlete or every person who sets a goal ahead of them, they work towards that so that they can change their practices to receive the results that they want. If our result is righteousness, we're going to start practicing righteousness. And I'll have something to say about that here, Lord willing, in a couple of months in more detail. But for our purposes this morning in 1 John 3, this individual is not in the Lord. He is not practicing righteousness because he is practicing sin. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Now we're flipping over here. Whoever is practicing sin is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. That's John 8, 44, from the very beginning. He was a liar, the father of all liars. The reason for the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. If we are truly born of God, you wonder about yourself? Maybe we worry about our reputation, what others think. But do we wonder or worry about who we really are? You know what? I'll give you this quote, and I hopefully, Lord willing, will be able to give it to you several times. Reputation is what other people think you are. Character is what you are. Which one do we worry about? Which one do we work on? John is telling us here, the one who practices righteousness is righteous. And he keeps on here in this chapter here, verse nine, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. This is why we're gonna stress over and over while we are alive here is that if you don't have the word of God in your life, you cannot develop and grow and mature as a righteous child of God. You just can't do it. That's why you have to continually practice the reading of God's word to learn to instill the truth within you so that you will grow. The seed has to be planted and then we'll just wait. Yeah, I had the seed planted in me. I was baptized in 2004. Praise be, I'm a child of God. Well, what have you done since? Well, no, the seed was planted. You're going to plant the seed and walk away from it and expect it to grow? 
You have to water it. You have to nurture it. You have to weed it, take the weeds out because sure as the devil is the devil, weeds will come. We have to take those out of our life. Now I'll tell you how I have taught this when I was a young father. I thought when I read 1 John 3 verse 9, what I say is, what John is telling me is that my two sons will never, ever slam dunk a basketball. That's what that's saying. You think, boy, what version are you reading from, Kenny? Have <laughs> you seen that? Uh, well, what it is, is that the reason my two sons, and they've told me later, said, Dad, we're going to prove you wrong. <laughs> they haven't yet. They're both over six foot, but they haven't done it yet. The reason why they can't slam dunk a basketball is because their daddy can. And their daddy's seed is in them. Now there's other things they may be able to do or may not be able to do. But when their seed is in them, why is it we always say, oh, look at her. She looks just like her mom. Oh, he looks just like his daddy. Oh, that sounds like daddy. Why do we say that in wonder? Well, it's no big wonder. Their daddy's seed is in them. That's what the seed is produced physically. And in the mannerisms of how a child develops. And it's no wonder, and it should be no surprise, but it's still a wonder to us. Wow, look at her. She looks just like her mama when she, her mama was 15. Uh, yeah, what happened to her mama? Uh, <laughs> I can say that, Dewey's not here. <laughs> but I'm sure one of you will tell us. But you, you, you see, the, the point here is that <clears throat> when God's seed, and we have it in our hand, when God's seed is planted in us and it is nurtured and watered and developed and kept as a practice in our life, a part of our life, it's going to start growing. And when it grows, the seed of the corn stalk produces corn. The seed of a tomato plant produces a tomato. That's no great revelation. The seed of truth from heaven will produce a child of God. That's the natural law with vegetables. It's the spiritual law with the word of God. And that should come as no great surprise. But the person who is practicing unrighteousness, there's no seed there. The seed was long gone. Like the parable of the sower. Maybe it landed on hard rock. It blew away. Or maybe it landed in the tares. The weeds grew up around it and choked it out and the word doesn't live there anymore. That's why the word has to live and abide in us. That's why we read that it is quick, that is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is the truth. Stop here for a moment, think about this. Let's take the Bible, close it up, put it on the shelf, and let's act like it never existed. Where are we going to go to find out where we came from? <clears throat> where are we going to go to find out how the earth got here? Now we'll have theories. There are all kinds of things that happen, but they're just a guess. You know, number three I've got up here at the step is that you formulate a hypothesis. You know what a hypothesis is? That's just a fancy word for guess. We'll have a scientific hypothesis. But when it's been tested with the word of God, it's no longer a guess. It is a conclusion of fact because this is what we're learning. That which we have heard, that which we have seen, that which we have handled. There's the test and the retest. And they did it again over a portion, a portion of three years. They heard him. They saw him. They touched him. Even after he was raised, he said, touch my hands. Put your hand in my side. I am the person. I'm not a ghost. I'm the body that you put on the cross. He said we were there to test him and test him tangibly. It was not an apparition. It was not a vision or a thought or a guess. It was really there. What was it? We found out it was the words of life. The truth. Where else are you going to go find the words of life? As our Lord said to disciples, are you going to go too? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, John says. 
Where else? Now, that's a great question that's just as relevant today as it was back then. Where would we go? You're going to go to the bookstore and say, yeah, where's your section on truthful answers of where we came from? Well, we got lots of science books. I don't want science, I want truth. I don't want a hypothesis, I don't want to guess. I want verified facts. And John is saying, these became the verified facts for all of us. And so that's what we're declaring to you now, that God is the light, and that seed, when it's in us, will cause us to grow, become his child, and practice righteousness. But if we practice lawlessness or sin, we're lying to ourselves. We're doing exactly what the Lord, what, what the devil wants us to be. Let's, let's finish out this little section here in uh, John 3, verse 9 again. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Does that say that it's impossible to sin? No, it's not impossible to sin. But before the sin, you take the seed out of the heart. That's what we do. When we want to sin, for whatever it is, we take God and say, excuse me for a moment, let's take his word out of our, it's no longer going to guide me. When you were 10 years old, and you wanted to do something that your parents didn't want you to do, did you do it in front of your mama? You waited until mama was gone, then you did it. Now mama would find out, and you knew that she'd probably find out, but we're not going to do it while mama's there. We're not going to sin while the seed of God's word is in us. We want to take the seed out of us. Then we'll go sin. And then in sorrow, in contrition, and in great heartbreak, we confess our sins and repent. And God comes back and he'll cleanse us from our sin and his seed comes back. Now will we let it grow? Will we nurture it? One more verse here, verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. That's a brutal, brutal truth, brother. You want to find out if you or if a brother or a sister is living as a child of God? Just look at what they do. Look at where they go. Listen to how they talk. Watch how they live. That's how you know. And the results are indisputable and sometimes heartbreaking. That's the power of the truth. As the rest of that verse in Hebrews 4.12, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword cutting us under the spirit it cuts right to the core that's what acts 2 37 is about and when they heard this they were pricked in their heart the truth of the gospel on the day of pentecost was like a sharp sword that pierced right through them and went right into their heart cut their heart open and it bled because they knew it was the truth you know the truth doesn't have much effect on hard hardened people the hearts that are humble the truth can do its work we go into surgery doctor cut me open and make it right whatever is inside me that's wrong whatever that is inside me that is potentially fatal I don't want you to just look at me and say oh I think you're going to be okay cut me open and take it out that's what the truth does. And it's not always pleasant. But if we didn't have the truth, where would we find the physician that would heal our soul? It's here. And John has gone through the steps to find it and describe it and to tell us that this is how we should live. So brother, my lesson for you this morning is that we know God is the light, but it's not just something that, oh, that's just a nice saying. In this passage, if you'll remember 1 John 1, John has systematically, and if we can use the word scientifically, people put a big, uh, we don't worship science, but if you want to talk about science, here's the process of science. 
and John used it. He didn't know that's what it was called, but he showed us that's what it was. And here's the conclusion, and that conclusion is indisputable. Tell someone that they cannot have the Bible, the Bible will not be allowed in their life, and that they now have to live by their own wisdom for the rest of their life. And people will say, really? Yeah, you just do what you want, go on. Parents sometimes reach a point of frustration where they tell the child, all right, just go on, do what you want. I think that's exactly what's happened with the Lord. With his people, all right? Romans 1, three times, he gave them over to a debased mind. If this is what you want to do, this is how you want to live, I've told you long enough, this is wrong. But if you insist on doing that, all right, do it. He's not approving of it. And he's not even condoning it, I believe. He's just simply allowing it, just like evil. He allows evil to happen because people want it so much, all right? Have a couple of years under your belt of evil. Maybe a couple of months. With some people, maybe it's just a couple of weeks or a couple of days. And see how you fare in an evil world. What will you want? You'll seek the light. The light is what will save you. And everybody at some point in their life, I'm convinced that I've seen many examples, you have too, where people who have lived in darkness so long, they're sick of it. They want the light. Tell me what to do. Our Lord is so wise to provide everything that we have. Not only physically, but far beyond that, to provide for us everything that we need spiritually. And he has given us his son. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He is the light of the world, and he has called us, as we studied a couple of weeks ago, that we now are the light of the world. We are the ones who carry his message, his truth, and his righteousness. How do we get that? It's right here. When this is in us, we can give it to someone else. How do you give someone life and light who needs it and wants it and asks for it if we don't have this in our soul first? This has to be there if we're going to share it. If you're here this morning and you are not a child of God, I don't know why. Maybe you know, but maybe you can be convinced to turn from the darkness and come to light because that's what we're affording right now. Any opportunity to help you to walk closer with the Lord. We want to help you. That's why we're here. Number one, to worship our God and offer to him our praise and gratitude for all that he's done. And secondly, to let his light shine to the world. And that light, as John has discovered, is the light of salvation. And if you want to come to it, we'll help you do that if you'll come while we stand. While we stand. <laughs> There's a call come ringing on the restless way. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessing goes from the light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Oh, we
be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're here this morning and uh, hope you have been edified and strengthened in your walk with God. A few announcements and uh, family business. First off, Evelyn and I are great are pleased to be back with you. We've been traveling a little bit. Uh, we saw Randy and Susan Johnson. They said to send you greetings. Uh, Randy is serving now as an elder in the congregation where they are worshiping. Uh, Shirley Surrender uh, was also, we saw her and had dinner with her, as well as the Lemuses. So they all sent greetings to all of you and hope that you're doing well. Um, as uh, James mentioned, um, some of the men are still up at the retreat this morning, so we're missing them. Uh, but we're glad that their better halves are here. And next weekend is the women's weekend. And because they're so much smarter than us, they're not going out camping in the woods. They're going to meet here and have the men serve lunch to them. So they've, they've got it wired. Uh, uh, if you're going to attend that uh, next Friday night and Saturday, please let uh, Brenda Stewart know. She's back there in the corner. Uh, they're also still looking for a uh, woman to lead some songs, and if you would let Ariel or Angela know, uh, they would appreciate if you're willing to do that. <clears throat> As Kenny mentioned, he'll be gone for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we will have some guest preachers for the next two weeks, and uh, you'll have an excellent Bible class teacher because I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, the... Please make sure to be here next Sunday morning. Uh, we're required by California law to have a corporate meeting every year. It takes just a few minutes. Uh, we'll do it right after services, right during this time. Uh, we have to just basically approve the board of trustees. Many of you have been through it uh, before, but we have to have a quorum of people. So please be here next week and hang around for just a few minutes. Um, as you... Uh, all I'm sure have been aware uh, a new war has broken out in our world, uh, in a very sensitive part of the world, and uh, please keep that in your prayers. It's a very tough time for those people living there, obviously, uh, but it can sure spread to a lot of places. And uh, so please pray that God's will will be done there. Uh, in the bulletin this morning, uh, you will see a report from uh, Yara Surrender, who is in India. Uh, I had two more baptisms this last uh, month. Uh, one really sweet picture in there of a lady in a wheelchair that was baptized, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, out by a river, not, not in a baptistry. <laughs> yeah, you get a wheelchair down by the river. Um, visitors, we thank you that you are here. Please, as James mentioned, fill out all these cards. Oh, and I was also handed this note. Uh, this is from Teresa Clark. If you remember a few weeks ago, uh, she told us that her nephew was in a horrible um, motorcycle accident. Uh, he's got a traumatic brain injury. Uh, Trey is in stable, but still in critical condition in the ICU. Uh, he has moments of clarity, but continues to struggle. The plan is to transport him to Texas. Uh, he's in Phoenix now, uh, where the parents live for continued healing and rehabilitation. Air transport is cost prohibitive, so the plan is to drive him in about 30 days after he's stable enough to travel. Thank you for your continued prayers. Please pray for his parents, Woody and Dee Dee Elmore, who are with him 24-7. Uh, so please keep that family and Trey in your uh, prayers for healing. Uh, that's an awful thing for a young man. Uh, well, for anybody, but uh, especially for a younger person that has uh, not lived a whole lot of that second life that uh, Kenny was talking about this morning. He's probably still in his first one. All right, I think I got everything. Uh, if you would please stand, we'll be led in our closing prayer. You would bow with me so we go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come to you at the close of this service thankful for the time you've allowed us to gather together to sing songs to lift prayers to you to partake in the lord's supper and to hear a portion of your word we're thankful for this blessing there's so many this morning that didn't have that opportunity and we're grateful for that 
Heavenly Father, we want to lift a few prayers to you this morning on behalf of the war in, in Israel. We know that their consequences are serious, and we pray that you'll watch over those leaders of Israel and the leaders of the Palestinian group who have decided to wage war at this time. We pray that you'll watch over them and may peace prevail in that area. We also lift up to you Trey this morning, who was in a bad car a motorcycle accident. We pray that you'll be with him, be with the doctors who are administering to him, be with his family, and give them the support that only you can bring. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those who are at the retreat this morning, or this weekend. We pray that they can return to us once again. Lastly, Heavenly Father, be with Kenny and Dewey as they travel this week. And Help them to return to us in a couple of weeks. May they have a safe and enjoyable time, Mother God. Heavenly Father, be with us this week. Help us to be focused on you. Help us to remember the truth, that you are the light. We pray these things in your Son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs>